Luke 17, 1 through 10, title of the message is called Increase Our Faith. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles, and I like the word, it's not in here, but the context is, and the apostles immediately said to God, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, I know it doesn't say the word small in here, but if you understood a mustard seed, it's one of the smallest seeds there is. If you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he is coming from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But he, will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper, gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he think, thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done simply what our duty was to do. And so the background here is Jesus here is teaching that if somebody offends you, you must forgive them. Not just once, but seven times in a day. In another, in another place, he said 70 times seven. And it's not like for you to go out and buy count or count. What he means is that you, you will continue to forgive as much as is needed, right? That's the context. It's a colloquialism. There is no end. As many times as there's forgiveness needed, you give forgiveness. The, the disciples, when they heard this, the first thing they say to Jesus is, increase our faith, right? In other words, my Rick Helguero translation, what you're asking is impossible unless you increase our faith. Jesus' answer turns them from the thought of not having enough faith to what faith really is. He's basically saying if there is real faith, you don't need more faith, you just need faith. A lot of faith, a little bit of faith, what you need is faith, and then faith needs to be activated. When you have faith, there will eventually be something that springs from that faith being applied. It's not so much great faith that is required as faith in a great God. So when the disciples heard this uh, about forgiving so many times, they said, and this is our first point, increase our faith. Now, the first question we would have to ask ourselves is, what? is faith. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, the classic definition of faith says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, I like Kenneth Hagin. He teaches on this. He said the first thing it says is now faith. Faith is present tense. Hope is future tense. We hope for something but faith brings that future tense into a present reality, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It doesn't have to manifest yet, but we know it's, it's there because of faith. For instance, it says the substance of things hoped for. So another way of saying that is the title deed of things that we hope for as we talked about before you can have a piece of land that has been given to you for as let's just say an inheritance you inherited a piece of land you may have never seen this land you may have never touched foot on this land you've never seen pictures because we're talking about you know we're not talking about today where everybody has pictures of stuff but we're talking about but if you have the title deed to this piece of land even though you've never stepped on it you've never been there you've never seen it with your eyes you know that land is yours that's what faith is. Faith is the title deed of things hoped for, the assurance 
or the convincing evidence of things not seen. If you were to serve on a jury, when you serve on a jury, what they want to do is they want to convince you of something, whether it be the a prosecutor or the defendant, of something you were not privy to. And so they present all the evidence, and their hope is that when presenting the evidence, you will see what they're saying. You will actually, in some ways, be able to see what happened and make a decision based on what you see, even though you were never there. It's convincing evidence, right? Faith is the assurance or the convincing evidence of things not seen. And it goes on and says in verse 2, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now, Moses is writing about something that nobody was there to witness. How do we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God because God revealed it to us through his word? And when we accepted God's word, we came to understand what happened, even though none of us were there to see it. You understand? So we witness, we see, we come to an assurance of things, we understand through believing what God says in his word. We understand that the world is as God has said, not as we think. We trust and we walk by what the Word of God says and reveals to us. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. You've often heard, says, you've heard, often heard in church, the world says to do this, but God says to do this. Why does the world say to do this? Because according to their way of functioning, according to their way of living life, they live by what they see, they live by what they can reason. They live by what they understand. This is what they do. But God, who is bigger than our simple lives, who is bigger than our way of looking at things, who created the system, who created the universe, who set all these things in place, when God says something, he has a greater picture of how things are. He knows how things are supposed to be. And so we have the choice. Do I live by what I see or do I live by what God says? I've learned that it's better to live by what God says than to live by what I see or than to live by what people tell me I should be doing instead of by living by what God tells me I should be doing. Right? We walk by faith. I believe God and I live my life in accordance to what the Word of God tells me, not by sight. Well, what if God tells me to do something that doesn't make sense to me? He will always tell you to do things that doesn't make sense to you. Sowing financial seed doesn't make sense to the world, but it makes sense to God. Because it's not about what makes sense to us, it's about believing what God says. If God says, this is what you do, then by faith you trust that God is faithful to his word and you do it. And eventually when you do what God says, you will see the fruit of what God has said. Abraham, the father of faith, didn't have to understand all that God was asking him to do. He heard the word of God for his life and he acted on what God told him. And that's basically what faith is. It's trusting in God's word enough to act on it. In a nutshell, faith is obedience to the word of God. Hear what God is saying and do what God says to do. It's that simple, right? In Abraham's case, Genesis 12, 1 through 4, the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now, we like to focus on the fact that we shall be a blessing, and we say, okay, well, I'll do what Abraham did, but you don't put yourself in Abraham's place. Abraham had a 
family. He had a, uh, uh, probably had a business. He probably had all his people, all his family, all his relationships were in that place. All, all that he knew, all his life was in that, was in that place. Back then, they didn't have uh, uh, AAA. They didn't have, uh, uh, you know, the, the, what, is that the one you call when, you, when your car breaks down? They didn't have AAA. They didn't have GPS. They didn't have maps of the world, anything, all of that. God said, I want you to leave, and Abraham basically did it. Well, it doesn't make sense to me. didn't make sense to Abraham either. But he trusted God. God said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot with, went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Hebrews 11 and 8 says, by faith, because I want to tell you, this is what faith is. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place where he would receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Well, if you'll tell me, Lord, if you'll show me, if you'll make it make sense to me, then I'll do it. But that's not faith. That's faith in what we can understand, faith in what we can reason, faith in what we can see. But true faith is believing that what God says to us is what's right, and I'm going to do what God says to us, even though everything else around me wants to say something different. So the apostles came to Jesus, and they said, increase our faith. Jesus comes back to them and basically tells them, point number two, a small amount of faith is sufficient. So the Lord said, if you have faith, as small, and I am adding the word small in there, as a mustard seed, you can do incredible things. You can say, because that's really the gist of what he's saying. You can say to this mulberry tree, and he was probably looking at a mulberry tree and pointing at them. You can say to that mulberry tree, if you had the smallest amount of faith, because it's not about the amount of faith, you can say, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. As we saw in our text, when Jesus told the disciples the necessity to forgive up to seven times a day, the disciples decided that something like that was so beyond anything they could imagine that to do so would require supernatural uh, assistance. And so they concluded the only way they could comply with such a mountain of a charge was that they would need a supernatural importation of faith. And so they asked Jesus to give them that. And then Jesus proceeds to teach them another parable. Uh, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in the field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So basically, it's not the size of the seed, which is what you're basically saying is, give me a bigger seed. And Jesus is saying, it's not the size of the seed. There's no need for a bigger seed but basically to sow the seed that you have into the ground. The man had to sow the seed for the seed to become a tree. The sowing of the seed would eventually produce the fruit as they trusted what God said and acted by faith in doing what he said. So Jesus was basically telling the disciples through the parable that it's not more faith that is needed, but to put the faith that you have into effect by doing what I said to do. Forgive them. It's too hard. I can't. You're going to have to help me, Lord. And basically, Jesus is saying, just forgive them. Well, I don't know if I can say because we're trying to forgive with our emotions. We're trying to feel like forgiving, and it's not that at all. It's obeying. You will probably never feel like forgiving anybody. What you feel like doing, because Jesus said, if they strike you on the cheek, he had to teach them to do something different, because what they felt like doing was striking them back. Right? Have you ever gotten to an argument with your spouse, and they struck you with something, I'm talking about with words, and what do you immediately want to do? You want to word them back. Right? Well, let me tell you something, right? I think we had, I won't mention their names, but we had somebody in the crowd that said, yeah, we got an argument about who won the last argument. <laughs> I 
I won the last argument. No, I won the last argument. And the next thing you know, you're in another argument, right? <laughs> there's no need for more faith. There's no need for one upping. It's, there's none of that. I forgot how I got off on that. I'm trying to find my way back. It's about, it's about, oh yeah, the disciple says, we need more. We need, we need more faith. We can't do that. And basically, Jesus is saying, just do what I told you to do. He said, you don't need more faith. You just need to obey. We don't like that today. In our culture, we don't like the word obey. Right? We, we, we believe, see, in our culture, everybody has an equal say. Right? We have what's called a round table. And when you sit around a round table, there's no head. There's no body in charge. And, you know, that's okay with our culture, even though that's not really true in our culture. If you go to work at a company, you're going to find pretty quick you got people that are bosses over you. And if you don't obey and submit, you're going to find yourself trying to get a job with another company. Right? But in the kingdom of God, we want to bring that mentality is that nobody can tell me what to do. And the truth is, you're right. Nobody can. They can uh, you're wrong in this sense. They can tell you what to do, but nobody can make you do what they want, what they want you, what they want you to do. But God has the right to tell us what to do. But when he tells us what to do, he's not trying to, to, to make us and force us and, and try to do things. No, he, he wants us to understand that he is faithful, he is loving, he is trustworthy. He wants to do what's best for you. But imagine trying to detail the way the universe works in a way that you can understand so that you will obey. It's impossible. We would never grab it. We would never grasp it. So God wants us to learn how to trust that he knows how the universe works. He knows how this world works. He knows how you work. He knows what you need. And so sometimes I don't have the time to tell my children, don't touch that stove because it's hot or uh, this is happening or I just wired this. And I don't have the time to tell them that. I, they, if I did, they couldn't understand. I just say, don't do that. Do this. I've got a, I've got a, a dog. I'm not comparing y'all to dogs. I'm just, just seem to fit at this particular time. I've got a dog named Keeley, and he's a schnauzer, full-blown schnauzer. And one of the things that you got to help me get back, okay? You got to help me get back to what I was talking about. Uh, it may be too late. Maybe a lost cause. But anyway, and he, one of the traits of schnauzers is they're stubborn. And so, how many of you know that you can't really explain to a dog? What, why you don't need to be doing this and, and, and how he needs to be going about. You have to train them, but you can't really explain to them. And so one of the things that we tell Keely, and, and, and we have another dog named Gimli, like uh, I'll, I'll go down this direction, is that we, we, they have to be let out every so often, right? But sometimes I'll come in. Every time I come in from outside, they think it's time to go out, and I have to tell them, no, you're not going outside. And they were like, well, why? No. <laughs> Because you bark at those kids. So we have a daycare next to us. And so you bark with those kids. And those kids are created in the image and likeness of God. And as long as you're out there barking at those kids that are created in the image and likeness of God, you're not doing the will of God, and so I'm not going to let you out. And they're just like, huh? And sometimes it looks like they got to go out anyway, so you're like, you better not bark at those kids. If you bark at those kids, you know, I'm not letting you out anymore, you know. And the, you open the door, and, and, and they go out there, and you know the first thing they do? They bark at the kids. Now, I'm trying to give you the understanding is that those dogs are never going to understand life at my level. They just have to learn how to obey. Now, in no way am I comparing myself with the Lord. But think about us. We were created in the image and the likeness of God, but we will never be able to understand God at his level. So we have to learn how to obey. Just do what I say, right? And sometimes that's what, we want our, what I want my dogs to do, just do what I say, right? Now, God's not 
the same. He's not quite in that vein because he's a good God. But what he's trying to tell the disciples is sometimes you just have to do what I say. Well, I don't want to. That's your choice. You can choose not to do that. He, the, one of the greatest gifts he gave us is free will. But if you want to learn how the kingdom of God works and you want to experience the benefits of the kingdom, you have to learn how to do what he says. That's faith. Do what he says, right? Yes. Okay, you're going to need this, and I'm going to give you two minutes. I'll get it, I'll get it in the one, The $1 and the $20 bill were on the conveyor belt. They were used up, burned up, and they were fixing to go uh, to the treasury to be burned up. And uh, they got in a question in a, a conversation, and $1 says, man, where all you been? $20 goes, I've been to the boardwalks. I've been to the cruises. I've been to New York. I've been up in, you know, uh, Georgia. I've been all across the world. I've been, you know, just too many places. And twenty dollars said, one dollar. I'm sorry. He said, what uh, about, what about uh, where you've been? I didn't mean to get caught up about myself. The one dollar said, well, I've been to the Baptist church. I've been to the Episcopal church. I went across the Assembly of God church. And they get, and the twenty dollar bill looked at the one dollar bill and said, what's a church? I tell you that to tell you fastest. I can tell you right here, testimony. In two thousand, in nineteen eighty-seven, December the fifth, sixth time frame. I was out of money. I was borrowing twenty dollars gas money. I was just trying to make ends meet, and I I knelt down in a little trailer house I had bought for twenty five hundred dollars in nineteen eighty six. This was nineteen eighty seven, and I knelt down with tears running out my eyes and said, "God, I'm yours. I can't make it. I haven't been faithful. I don't give. I don't do. I can't bless nobody because I ain't got twenty dollars to my name." And I knelt down. And I said, God, in the morning, I'm going to put in applications. It's December when all the contractors laid off, December 5th, 1987. And I knelt down and put in two applications on Friday morning. And both of them, Gulf States, and another one said I could start Monday. That was unheard of at that time. And I could start Monday. And I said, let me pray for at least double figures per hour because I cannot afford. And I said, God, if you'll pull me out of this bind that I've got myself into, I'll follow you. I'll learn. I'll learn to give. I'll learn to do what your voice, still small voice says. The next day, I stuck in two applications. Both told me I could start Monday. Two days later, I chose which job. I went into Dow. You've never been in Dow before. January, I'm in Dow, December. I walk in. I put an application in January one month later. And I said, God, I'll be faithful from now on to your call, to your will. I put in the I went in January, I went inside down, I stuck in an application. I'm going through in June, July, six months later, and all that time I did what I said with God. And, and, and as I walked by the house, I stopped at my mom's. I was upstairs, and the phone was right there, the old phone that was on the landline. And I, hello? I didn't live there. I was heading to that $2,500 trailer I lived in. Hello? Uh, I'm talk, looking for Bubba. Bubba hey, right, long story short, Roger Cody, want to give you a chance to come with Dow. Hired me September 11th of 1988. In less than one year, God took me to a job, and I'll be 34 years there this year in September. Why? Not because of who I am, but because of who I am. And there's people, and we're not, he's not just, pastor's just not talking about faith and money. That's not what I'm trying to talk, but I'm saying faith and healing, faith in every area of our life until we learn to give up of ourselves. And, and, but it's just a testimony. God will take you to the next level to where you are to be, but we have to literally submit. And at that time, I didn't know how to submit. I didn't know how to submit with a dollar bill or a $20 bill or whatever, in, in faith in every area of healing, of your finances, every area. Try him and see if I won't open up a door and a window and pour you out a blessing which you can't contain, and it will run out. And that's all it is right there. Good word. So, in another parable, 
Jesus, and I'm glad he said that. It's, this, this is not just about money. This is about following God and doing what God says, and God always does what he says, whether it be in finances, relationships, uh, 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 economics, anything in life, God does that way. So in another parable, Jesus adds to our understanding of faith, and he expounds again on faith in answer to another query the disciples had, Matthew 17, 19 through 20. Uh, disciples tried to cast a demon out. They had had success casting demons out, but another one came while Jesus was not with them. They couldn't cast it out. And Jesus comes down from the mountain and casts it out. And the disciples come to Jesus privately and say, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Before assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I heard somebody say it. It's like, a mustard seed faith is probably one of the smallest seeds on the planet. Your faith is less than that. Can you imagine if you were a disciple, if Jesus was telling you that? Because you, you, you don't even have that much faith. But that's not what he was saying. Okay? What he was saying, another way of translating that, and this is my opinion, and you can, of course, interpret it how you weigh, but another way of translating that is your faith was too brief. In other words, you encountered an obstacle, and you let the obstacle tell you that you can't do this. You were able successfully to cast out demons out of every person that you have met up to now. But when you faced a demon that was said, no, you said, I can't, instead of doing what I said to do. And so sometimes that happens to us as well. When the Lord speaks something to us and we begin to do it and it appears like the circumstances get worse. It appears like the circumstances rise up and say, you're not going to do this. This is not going to happen in your life. And what we end up doing is we put our faith in the circumstances. We put our faith in the opposition because really that's what you're doing. You're believing more in what the opposition is saying, what the circumstances are saying, than you are in God. So it's not a lack of faith, it's an unbelief in God and a belief in something else. And that's what happened with the disciples. Uh, they, their faith was too brief. They gave up because they began to believe what the circumstances were telling them. In James 1, 2 through 4, he says to the, to the Christians, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Can I tell you something as a Christian? You're going to face trials. You're going to go through difficulties. I would love to tell you that if you're a Christian, you're going to be blessed beyond measure, which you will be, but it will be evidenced by bigger houses, more cars, and not just more cars, what kind of cars, and boats, and all this. I would love to tell you that. And in some of you, it might be the case, but for some of you, it might be the absolute opposite. You might lose your job, you might lose your friends, you might lose your circumstance, you might lose your family, you might lose a lot following after Jesus. But you know what? You believe God and you trust Him, and eventually God can bring all things together for good. Now, I would love it to be one way, but if you were in Iran or if you are in China and you put your faith in God, the likelihood is that you might die. And so this gospel that says, whether you're in Iran or China, that if you just believe God, you can have a bigger house, a Rolls Royce, you can have all this kind of stuff. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It really depends on the context. And depending on, if it depends on the context, then it's not the Word of God. Because the Word of God is true no matter what. That's why we call it the American gospel and not the gospel. James says, consider it pure joy when you go through various trials and circumstances because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Right? Some of y'all come to church when everything's going good. But if something does go good, we don't come to church. Some of you are just the opposite. When things are going good, you don't come to church. But when things start going bad, you start coming to church. What you haven't learned how to do is to live by faith yet. Because faith is consistent no matter the circumstances. I'm going to trust God when things are going good. And I'm going to trust God when things are going bad. I'm not going to let my circumstances change who I am. Faith, true faith, is marked by perseverance. 
Let perseverance have its perfect work so that you might be mature. God wants us to grow up in Him. He wants us to grow up, not just individually, but as a body. He wants us to reflect who He is. Faith is marked by perseverance and persistence. Abraham, the father of faith, demonstrates that through his walk and through his life. It says in Romans 4, 16 through 22, Therefore it is of the faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. You don't have to understand it. Just basically we're getting to Abraham, and he is a father of faith, and he is our father as well. What was it like for Abraham? As it is written, God said, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls things which do not exist as though they did. Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope believed. What was happening? God had promised him, but he wasn't seeing the fruition of the promise. He kept doing what God said. He kept walking through the land, but it just seems like what God promised him, that he was going to have a son, it didn't happen. 25 years walking through the land, no son. The Bible says, in hope, against hope, he believed. So that eventually he did become the father of many nations according to what God promised him, so shall your descendants be. Not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. So the bottom line is, he looked at his body in the natural, and his body said to him, we're too old. Right? And then, and I don't recommend this for uh, marriage relationships, then he looked at his wife and said, she's too old. <laughs> but the Bible says, because the Bible says, uh, uh, you know, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. But the Bible says he did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief. What does that mean? Even when everything around him was screaming that this is never going to happen, Abraham kept believing God. Being strengthened in faith, he kept giving glory to God, being fully, fully convinced that what God had promised and he was able to perform and therefore was accounted to him as righteousness. And eventually he did see the promise of God come to pass in his life. He did see what God had promised him. He did witness it with his own eyes. It took 25 years. A lot of us get tired after 25 minutes. Lord, I've been, I've been believing you and standing on the promise of God for 25 minutes and nothing's happened. Abraham, 25 years. And then he saw the fruition of what God told him to do. I want you to know that God is faithful. God doesn't live in time like we live in time. But God says it's going to happen. You take it to the bank, it's going to happen. But it's determined by whether or not we can stand on the promises of God through whatever it is that we're walking through. We have to believe God. It brings us to our last point. you got to act on your faith. Luke 17, 7 through 10, which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit and dine to eat, but he will not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper, gird yourself, serve me till I have eaten and drink and, uh, drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink. Does he think that servant, does he thank that servant because he did the things that was commanded him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, you don't need more faith, you just need to do, right? Say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done what our duty was to do. We've already alluded to this in the point, of, uh, point above, but we need to be absolutely clear about this principle. Faith is not truly faith without action. We tend to equate faith with knowing. Go to church, learn the principles, learn the stories, read the Bible, we know, right? If I have a knowledge of something, it's the same as believing it. No, not biblically. Biblically, you can know all you want, but if you don't do anything with it, you're just a know-it-all. That, that one just came out. It was for free. Yeah, I thought it was better than what you... Anyway, you got to do something with it, right? It's like you can learn all you want about 
uh, uh, what it is to run a business, to have a business, run a business. You can get a master's, bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD. You can teach in a college all about business and never once have owned a business. Only in America. We come into America. Right? But that don't mean you know how to run a business because you've never done it. And that's what churchgoers, uh, we go to church, learn the stories, learn the principles, memorize it, but do we do it? You've got to be a doer of the word, right? You've got to uh, hear the word of God. What does the word of God say? A lot of times what we do is not the word of God. We do what we think is the word of God. Or we do what we want the word of God to be, but we don't do what the word of God says to do. And then it's not just what does the word of God say to do, but what is the spirit of God bringing to mind in your life? Are you hearing what God is saying to you about your life and your particular situation? You've got to hear the word of God. Jesus said, when you've done all the things which you are commanded, which I have said to you. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear the word of God, and then very simply, you've got to do what you hear. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you have commanded, very simple, right? When you have done what what i commanded you to do then you say it was just our duty not well to do what you want me to do i'm going to need more faith i'm going to need more for confirmation i'm going to need no just do what he tells you to do very simple what was it bobby said one time he's used to used to the lord's telling him to speak certain amounts to give and one day the lord said no i want you to give a dollar what Give a dollar? I've never given a dollar before in my life. I give more than that. You know, I, I'm, I'm extrapolating, right? But it wasn't about the amount. It was about obedience. You have to obey. It doesn't have to make sense to your head. It has to, it has to be obedience to what God has said to you. It's obedience that demonstrates faith, and faith is the currency of the kingdom. James 2, 17 through 26. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and someone else will say, I have works, and I'll say, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe that and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made complete, and the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him or accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. It's not just, I believe, I believe. Did you do what he said? Right? Some of you don't even do what you say. <laughs> Sorry, forgive me. I can't have many people say, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to be there every time the church is open. What? And I see you three months later. Right? You don't even do what you say. How, do you expect, how, do I, how am I going to expect for you to do what God says? But if you can't even do what you say, you know, that's, that, that, that right there is an inkling of the fact that you're probably not going to do what he says. And then you wonder why Christianity doesn't work, because you don't do what he says. Simple. You know how Christianity begins? You believe God. The first thing he tells you to do is to get baptized. Well, I don't know, you know. What is it about baptism? Baptism is the first command he gives us as disciples, Right? And baptism sets the tone for your Christian life. How does it set the tone? Do you do what he tells you to do? Obey. It's very simple. Do what he says. That's faith. Do what he says. Luke 17, 11 through 19. It happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then as he entered a certain village, there were ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. Now, how many of us, well, I was hoping he'd come over here 
and he'd lay hands on me like he did that other leper over there, or he would do this. And, and, you know, we have all these expectations, but what you don't realize is he gave you what you needed, which is the word. All you need from God is a word from God. He said, go show yourself. How is that going to help me? I go to the priest, you know, they're going to just look at my leprosy and they're going to say, you still got leprosy. But that's not what you, go show yourself to the priest. And listen to what it says. It, it, and so it was that as they went. In other words, we want to be clean and then go. But a lot of times you're not going to get clean until you go. Right? We want to be healed and then obey. But a lot of times you need to realize you're not going to get healed until you obey. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when they saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God, fell down at his face, at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Where there are not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Where there are now any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to them, Arise, go your way. And this is what I want you to say. Your faith... Now, See, he had already been healed, but that's not what he's saying. Not only did your faith heal you, your faith made you well. That word for well is the word sozo. It means your faith has made you complete. Your faith has made you whole. Some of us just want to exercise faith for what we want. We don't want to exercise our faith to glorify God. When you, how do I exercise my faith to glorify God? If you love me, keep my commandments. Right? So to conclude, in our text, Jesus here taught that if someone offends, we must forgive repeatedly. Apparently, the apostles thought that was impossible, so they needed more faith. And Jesus said, no, that's not what you need. What you need to do is you need to act on what I told you to do. You just need to obey. If there's real faith, action follows. Mark 11, 22 through 24, Jesus said to them, have faith in God or have the faith of God or have God-like faith. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that the things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So maybe the take home for us today is, is that it's not more faith that we need, but we need to act on our faith. You got a mountain in front of you, right? You pray about the mountain, God says to you, go speak to the mountain. Why? Because if you speak to the mountain, the mountain will move. Some of us don't even want to admit we have mountains in our life. We live in denial. We're like the ostrich with his head in the sand. What mountain? I don't see any mountain. Or we think faith is denying that there's a problem. Faith is not denying there's a problem. I don't have no problem. What problem? Don't talk to me. I don't want to I don't say what it is. Ah. That's not faith. That's deny. That's not what he said. Have God-like faith. What is God-like faith? you got to know there's a mountain there. There is a problem. Right? Some of us don't want to go to the doctor because we're afraid the doctor might tell us something bad. What you're doing is you're denying the problem. Go to the doctor. Well, what if it's a bad report? What if it's a good report? But if it's a bad report, at least you know, and then you can begin to do what God says and speak to the mountain. You can address the problem. You can deal with the problem. What does God tell me to do about the mountain? In this particular case, he said, speak to the mountain. What do I speak? What are the promises of God? If you've got a sickness and disease, God reveals to you something and his word about the problem that you're going through. You begin to quote the word of God. You stand up to that problem. You stand up to the sickness. You stand up to the disease, it, you know, and you quote, you quote the word of God. You know, what does the word of God say? God forgave all my iniquities. He healed all my diseases, right? He carried my sicknesses. He bore my pains. By his stripes I am healed. To the one who fears his name, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And I will go forth like a calf leaping from its stall. You begin to speak to that mountain. You say sickness and disease. Uh, you know, in the name of Jesus, you may have a, 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 an input into my life right now, but in Jesus' name, I stand against you. I command you to leave. You will have no problem. You will have no authority. You will have no influence in my life and I take it a step further I say in the name of Jesus you will never come against me or my family or my descendants ever again well what if it doesn't move then you speak again because the context here whoever speaks to the mountain and keeps on speaking 
And sometimes that thing don't move right away. But it doesn't mean that God's word's not true. It just means you've got to keep speaking to the mouth. Somebody else is not.